Here's the context for you. Anytime you see a therefore in scripture, you need to know what that therefore is therefore. I was taught that as a very young child, and it's very true. Here in Hebrews chapter 12, the reason that Hebrews chapter 12 begins therefore is because Hebrews chapter 11 is what we call the hall of faith. The hall of faith is the uh, conglomeration of all of the folks in the Old Testament who had lived a very faithful life. Abraham is mentioned, Noah is mentioned, Sarah is mentioned. Uh, Jephthah, when I told you the Bible is relevant, if you ever want to hear about gangbangers in the Bible, go to Judges chapter 11. Jephthah was a gangbanger. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about Jephthah's story because Jephthah and Barak and Samson are one of the folks that, uh, that the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 ends with. Jephthah was a, a, a guy whose dad uh, went and slept with a prostitute and when he was born, his brothers were born to, their, to a different woman and his brothers kicked him out of the house. When his brother kicked him out of the house, the Bible specifically says that he went and joined himself to vain men, okay? When the Hebrew word says vainless men, it literally means worthless fellows. That means people who were not trying to make Jephthah succeed in any way. When it came time for the Ammonites to fight the Israelites in Judges chapter 11, the Israelites go and get the head of the game, Jephthah. Jeff is what I call him for short. And so they go to me, Jeff, and say, will you be our captain and fight for us? And he says immediately, didn't you kick me out of my dad's house? Why is it that when you're in trouble, you come and talk to me? Man, if that ain't the hood in today's world, I don't know what is. And so Jephthah ends up going and fighting the Ammonites. And we find out that Jephthah still has his history in his mind. But what, one of the things that Jephthah does is he makes this vow that if the Lord gives him strength to defeat the Ammonites, he would sacrifice the first thing that he saw come out of his house. What ends up coming out of his house first is his only daughter. And he ends up sacrificing her. Why am I telling that story? To remind you of what I said last night. It's just a messed up folk. You ain't talking about cats who are completely faithful all the time as it related to the will of the Lord. You're talking about some messed up people that the Lord used for his glory and honor. And so if you're up in here and you're like, man, I'm too messed up to be used by the Lord. No, you're perfect to be used by the Lord. If you're up in here and you say, man, I'm really good. The Lord can use me. He can't use you. All right? But if you messed up, he can use you. I'm messed up, so I know he can use me. All right? Um, the reason I want to begin that way is because when uh, the writer of Hebrews begins in chapter 12 saying, therefore, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he's saying to you the same thing, he's saying to us the same thing I just said to you. Look, it's not like you live in a Christian life that hasn't been lived before. It's not like you go into Christianity on your own. It's not like somebody hasn't already wrestled through all of the concepts that you're wrestling through. That's already happened. And so you have 66 books of experience. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there is no temptation that comes to us except what is common to man. But God will, with the temptation, provide an escape. I want you to understand something. You're not going through anything different than has been talked about in these pages of the Bible. Now, the concepts might look a little different. Again, they didn't deal with the internet, but they dealt with something very similar. I mean, they dealt with, when I say similar, I don't mean the world at your fingertips like we have today. What I also mean is they dealt with things that we don't have to deal with. And so the temptations were the same, as I said before in 1 John chapter 2. If you think, thinking, man, he should say something different this morning, I'm not going to say anything different than I said before. I'm just going to keep going further and pushing this. When he says we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the thing that you need to know is you are also surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. As I stated this morning to somebody else, Missions is my passion. People ask me all the time, how did you get into urban ministry? Because I'm a missionary. I love missions. AIA is a mission group. That's why I love AIA. I love Impact. I love crew because it's all about missions. I would love to be able at some point to come and preach at an AIA conference and see every single one of y'all's faces as people who have been planted on different campuses, living life, doing life with people, being that surrounding cloud of witnesses. I mean, you got folks up in here that are believers who love them some Jesus, who are ready and willing to disciple. Man, go and do it. Don't let anybody tell you you're too short, too fast, too slow, too whatever it might be. Ultimately, if God wants to use you, he can use you. Some of you are pursuing dreams that you never asked God about. Look, God ain't got a problem with you playing sports. As a matter of fact, as a man once said to me, God ain't got a problem with us having stuff. His problem is when we want our stuff more than we want him. And so if you got a sport that you didn't ask God if you could actually play it, my question to you is, why are you playing it? And if you say, for the love of the game, I'm, hey, again, like, you shouldn't do anything for the love of that thing, including even the snippets, which ultimately, everything should point us to the reality of who God is. It should point us to the enjoyment and the satisfaction 
that we experience when we know him in relationship with him. So seeing that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the writer of Hebrews then gives us some commandments, some imperatives. He first says, hey, seeing that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, people who have gone before us, let us lay aside every weight. Let me focus on weight just a little bit uh, for a second. I call it trimming the fat. I, all of you are athletes. You know you got to trim the fat, right? But the fat for me stands for friends, acquaintances, and treasures. Friends are the people that you choose to be around. They're the people that you call your homies, your mates, your whatever you call them, all right? Those are the people that you choose to be around. I love what Jesus says in John 15. He says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends, because I have committed to you everything that the Father has committed to me, which gives me the definition of friend from Jesus. The definition of friend is somebody with whom I can share all of the things that the Father God has shared with me. If you got some friends, I tell my young people this all the time. I tell my kids this as they get older. If you got friends that don't respect or like the fact that you're a Christian, can I tell you that they're not your friends? If you feel like you can't share the gospel with your friend, I'm telling you that person ain't your friend. And if you can't share the reality of the deepest and most intimate part of your life with another person, that person is not your friend. Since I said that, let me talk about missionary dating for just a second because we got some Christians up in here that's dating some non-Christians. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that that should be happening. You need to saturate that relationship with your absence. <laughs> And you need to get out now before you ruin that person's life and or before they ruin yours. Okay? I want you to understand something. When it comes to God's word, the Bible teaches in 1 John that God's commands to us are not grievous. It ain't like God is a cosmic killjoy or some police officer waiting behind a tree to pull you over spiritually. Ultimately, God wants what's best for you. When he says thou shalt not, he's saying don't hurt yourself. I got something so much better for you. As a matter of fact, I'm reading through Deuteronomy right now. Uh, I started reading the Old Testament and, and I'm reading through. When you look at what God commands, a lot of it just makes sense. It just makes sense. When he gives them dietary laws, things that they should eat and they shouldn't eat, it makes sense. Half of the stuff will kill you anyway. So it ain't like God is saying, I don't want you to eat bacon and enjoy it. God is saying, look, at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff is greasy, nasty, and bad. And I want my people to be a peculiar people, people belonging to me. And ultimately, all of this still has some practical value to it. I don't know if you knew this. Any bio majors in here? Any, any pre-med people? Also, you can put your hands down. When you look through the Bible, the idea of quarantining came from Scripture. That's what you're supposed to do. If somebody was sick, they were supposed to be put out of the camp for seven days, and you had to wash everything that they had ever touched. It became unclean. Even the person who was going to wash it was unclean. Quarantine came from Scripture. Man, there's so much in God's Word that we don't even know it comes from God's Word because we don't read God's Word anymore. We read more Shakespeare and Twilight than we do God's Word. I'm sorry, sometimes I just gotta, just gotta go there. Remember the reason that I'm going there. The text says every weight. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for weight here means it's the same uh, word where we get the word cummerbund. Anybody ever been in a wedding or had to wear a cummerbund? You go to prom, you wear a cummerbund, well, not anymore, but we used to back in the day because um, we thought that they looked good. I don't know why anybody ever thought that they looked good. <laughs> but what did they do? They held you together right here in the waist and surrounded you. So this idea of weights is the same idea. The idea is that there is something that is holding you back, something that is around you. And so not every single weight is a sin. At, at, at camp, when I do leadership development, we call them reds, greens, and yellows. Your reds are the things that you are not passionate about, they're not urgent, they're not important, and you find yourself doing them, like playing Halo, it, it, or playing Angry Birds on your phone. Those are reds. Don't act like you ain't done it. You know, some of y'all up in here, guys and girls, spend a whole lot of time on Pinterest, okay? If you haven't, don't put it on your phone. Please don't put it on your phone. Personal confessions of Timothy's Pope and his wife. Um, <laughs> Stay on task, stay on task, stay on task. Um, you would not, if you run track, if you play football, if you play anything where you have to run or move, the last thing you want to do is gain a bunch of weight, right? I mean, unless you play on the offensive line. But you want that weight to be muscle, <laughs> right? The last thing that you're going to do is put on more clothes if you run in track. I mean, you're not, there, there are no rules that say you can't run in sweatpants on the track. You think you're saying Bolt would do that? No, he wouldn't do that, because it'd be the dumbest thing in the world to do. You shoot your aerodynamics in the foot. Same thing with the Christian life. There's some of us who have friends that we don't need to have. 
That's the F. The A is acquaintances, when I talk about trimming the fat. That's the people that we allow to be around us. That's the people that, not necessarily that we want to spend time with them, but we find ourselves around them often, but we don't remove ourselves from them because we tend to hang out with them. We wouldn't necessarily say they're our friends, they're just our acquaintances. And you need to be mindful of who those people are. The third one is the T, the treasures. The treasures are the things that you love more than anything else. The Bible teaches in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, wherever your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. I love it. In Matthew chapter 13, I believe it is, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God as a man who found a, very, who found a field, and in that field he found a treasure, and he sold everything he had just for the field. What we do is, we do the same thing when we become a believer, but most of us get more caught up with the field than with the treasure in the field. We go and build us a 4,000 square foot house, get hooked onto the American dream. We got a three-car garage with a crossover, a son that we can drive with our top down, listen to the Jesus music, and a truck that we can put in that bad boy. We got 2.1 children, a cat and a dog that actually likes us. That white picket fence. Do you know what I mean by 2.1 kids? You know, we map everything out as Americans. I want you to understand something. Ultimately, I know this is gonna sound heretical at the beginning. The American dream is in stark contrast and conflict with God's call on your life. The American dream is in stark contrast and in conflict with God's call on your life and on my life to give up everything that we get. Jesus said, if any man come after me, he does not hate his brother, mother, sister, brother, wife, and children, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus said, if any man come to me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. When the Bible says, let us lay aside all of the weight and the sin that so easily surrounds us, the Bible is saying, the same thing that Morpheus told Neo. Any Matrix fans in the house? Y'all remember as Neo is first talking to uh, Morpheus, he says, the Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you turn on your television, when you look out your window, you can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. The first time that Neo is in the Matrix, you remember the first simulation. Neo is walking behind Morpheus. He sees the lady in the red dress. Before Neo can say anything, Morpheus turns around and he says, did you look? Before he can say anything again, he says, look again. When Neo turns around, you remember what happens? There's A.J. Smith with a gun in his face in the simulation. And then Morpheus says these words that are so true biblically. He says, see, our enemies in the Matrix are everyone and they are no one. A rapper back in the day said too much of anything can make you an addict. Not everything in your life is sin. Some of it is just waste. But there are some things that are sin that are clearly in violation of God's word. Can I tell you how many people I deal with? I deal with young girls who have told me, I was told all my life that I could not date boys. So you know what I begin to do? I begin to experiment with girls. There are boys that I've talked to that are the same way. They said, man, I couldn't talk to girls. And so I begin to experiment with boys, playing basketball. Everybody was naked in the shower. We begin to play around. We begin to experiment. Before you know it now, I'm a homosexual. And I have no idea how I got here. It, 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 I have no idea. I don't know who's standing back when I look in the mirror, but that's where I am. Talk to people all the time that are there. I want you to understand something. You gotta trim the fat constantly. If you're not constantly evaluating who your friends are, what influences are in your life, if you are in this room and every single person on earth needs a Paul or a Naomi, a Paul is a poor guy, a Naomi is poor girl, somebody who can teach you how to bring all things into obedience to Jesus. Every single one of us needs a Barnabas, somebody who will be a truth teller in our lives, will tell us the truth when we'd like to hear it least when we need to hear it most. Every single one of us needs a Timothy, somebody that we can entrust to them the things that have been entrusted to us. If you don't have those three key relationships in your life, please, if you are in a dating relationship, don't mess up somebody else's life. You can do bad on your own. If you don't have healthy relationships in your own life, don't go jack up somebody else's because you're selfish. That's the dad in me coming out. Verse 2. I'm sorry, the end of verse 1. Let us run then with patience the race that has been set before us. I want you to understand something. The race that you are running. In Psalm 23, the Bible says, uh, he, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, that Hebrew word that for pass is, is the same word as we get the word rut. Any deer hunters in the house? Any deer hunters in the house? You know what rut is then, I'm sure. Uh, for, the, for the rest of us, it's like a not, no, I'm not talking about deer anymore. 
uh, a rut or a groove that's in the road. Have you ever been on a road that's like really, really wet and nasty and, you know, everybody's driving on that road and before you know it, that road has this big gaping hole in it where everybody's tires, man? When the Bible says he leads me in paths of righteousness, when the Bible talks about the race that has been set before us, the idea is it's already been mapped out. As a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that's what the Bible teaches, that we are God's workmanship. is the Greek word poema, where we get the word poem from. We have been set up by God. He, uh, he prepared works before that we would fulfill. Folks, can I, can I free you up a little bit? When we talk about grace, you might have heard me say this in my prayer. There are some of you who think, man, I've got to leave here and I've got to make this thing happen now. I've got to work as long as I can. I've got to grind to stay out of sin. I've got to grind to make sure I'm chasing the Lord. Look, if you could do that, wouldn't you have done it already? The same grace that saves you is the same grace that's going to sanctify you. If you will run this amazing race, the way to run this amazing race is the same way you began it, and that is to surrender to the Lord, to trust Him, to allow His Holy Spirit to take over your life. The Bible teaches if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I can't tell you how many guys come and ask me, Pope, how do you stay away from pornography? I stay in the face of Jesus. I don't think to myself, I just need to stay away from my computer, I just need to stay away from this, I just need to stay away from that, I just need to stay away from this. Don't think about a pink elephant. What are you thinking about? A pink elephant. It's the way that we work. You ever done that? My wife does it all the time. I'm watching football, the children just come on, I'm not looking at the screen. My wife says, don't look at the screen. What does my kids both do? I look dead at the screen, and then I go, hey, why'd you do that? <laughs> like it's her fault at pinning out of the excuse. Now watch this. If you're still thinking about a pink elephant, I want you to think about a roaring lion. You know what you're thinking about now? How that roaring lion is going to tear the that pink elephant. That's what you're thinking about. If you're anything like me. And that's what it looks like. Instead of me saying, don't drink, don't party, don't go smoke weed, don't go sleep with your girlfriend, I'm going to say, focus on Jesus. And that's what this writer of Hebrew says. He says, let us run this race with patience. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who, uh, for the joy that was set before him, the joy of knowing you would be here and commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him wholeheartedly, going anywhere he asks you to go. He despised the shame. He endured the cross. Listen, and the Bible says he is set down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the throne of God. Now, I don't know who you are. Some of you I have gotten a little bit to know. I don't know who you are, but I know this. When practice is done, when you go home, when you get to your room, when you get to the house, wherever you might stay, you know the first thing you do? You sit down. Not true, is that not true? You've been standing all day, you've been practicing, you've been running, you sit down because there is this sense in which the work is done. You sit down, you take that deep breath, the work has been done. The fact that Jesus is sitting down at the right hand of God lets us know that the work has been done. Now, I've got to say this because I don't know how many of you all will see it again, so I've got to give you as much Bible as I possibly can. There are those who, even as believers, the Bible teaches that we will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. People are like, if I'm a believer, what will I be judged on? Can I bring you up one more time to tell you what you will be judged on? If the Bible is indeed true, and I believe that it is, in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, without Jesus, we can do nothing, right? The Bible says that he is the vine, and in verse 1 of chapter 15, he is the vine, we are the branches. If we abide in him, we will bear much fruit, right? If Jesus is the one bearing the fruit, if the vine is the one that produces the fruit, what is the branch responsible for? Carrying the fruit. Anybody in here a fisherman? Anybody like fishing? Yes, a lot of people. I love to fish, right? Uh, myself and Goody will get in a boat. I'll have my kids in a boat. My son Simeon will be fishing with me. Simeon has caught one of the biggest bass in the entire lake, and he caught it within five minutes of us fishing. He will be spoiled for the rest of his life. <laughs> but I want to tell you what happened. Simeon caught this humongous fish, right? It was a 16 and a half inch largemouth bass. And he caught it. We, we, we cast straight to the shore. We begin to drag back. Now, Simeon was four years old at the time, all right? We drag him back this way, and boom, bass hits, hook is set, we reel it in, we take a picture together. Goody actually took the picture on his phone, and I sent it to all of my family. Now listen, Simeon didn't cast the rod, Simeon didn't set the hook, and Simeon didn't reel it in, but it's Simeon's fish. <laughs> Daddy cast it and knew exactly where to cast it, because Daddy's a fisherman, an angler, and Daddy loves to do that. 
Daddy knew exactly how to set the hook because Daddy loves fishing and Daddy knew exactly how to do that. Daddy knew how to reel it in and let the thing play out in the water. And then when Daddy got it back in, Daddy handed it to Simeon and said, look, man, this is your fish. And Daddy took a big old picture with him with Daddy smiling just as much as Simeon was smiling. <laughs> so to my whole family, and they said, man, Simeon's becoming quite the fisherman. They know great good and well that wasn't him. It was me. But guess what? It's attributed to him. And Jesus is the same way. So you know what we get judged on? How well we held a pole. Because that's all Simeon was responsible for. I cast it out, here you go, son, and he just sits there like this. That's it. Yes, he spreads his legs out just like this. And he sits there and he holds the pole. And then I see him looking nervous and he starts doing this toward the boat. And I take the pole out of his hand, I set the hook, I reel it in, and I say, look, here's your fish. You will be judged, I will be judged on how much we remained in the vine because ultimately he's producing the fruit. So the more and more you surrender, the more and more God will use you. The less and less you surrender, the less and less God will use you. Andrew Murray, a famous missionary, said, uh, God will take full responsibility of the life that is yielded to him. I want to add to that. God will not take any responsibility of the life that is not yielded to him. Folks, understand, when you go forward home, have the right perspective. Have the right pursuits. Pursue the right things. Man, your actions, your, ultimately, this is how it works. Anybody in a dating relationship? Okay, great. You can put your hands down. For those of you who are not, is that why you look so sour? I'm just kidding. Um, very seriously, this is how it works. This is how I work with my wife. Somebody catches your eye. They catch your attention. Once they catch your attention, the more and more they catch your attention, they then catch your affection. The more and more they catch your affection, at some point you want to pledge yourself to them and they catch your allegiance. And then every action that you have is toward that individual. Dominique is rolling with us and we make fun of Dominique a lot because Dominique got engaged on, I think, December 19. And so if you catch Dominique on his phone, generally he is talking to his boo. I, and he spends a lot of time doing that. He wants to make sure that she knows where he is, what's going on. He is very sensitive to her needs, and that's the way he's going. I get a chance to do Dominique's marriage counseling. And so we chop it up, and we talk about what it's going to look like for him to be a husband and one day potentially a father. But what I love is watching how that process has happened, how she called his attention, how she grabbed his affection, how she grabbed his allegiance, and now all of his actions. This dude can't do nothing without thinking about her. And I'm the same way. Even as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about my wife. And I'm thinking about the time I get to talk to my wife. I'm thinking about my kids. And for those of you, if you ever get it, man, I'm telling you, and it's so true. My director says it all the time. The object of your worship will be the subject of your witness. Folks who ain't been in a relationship, they all of a sudden get in a relationship and you want to throw them in your own mouth every time you talk to them because all they talk about is this relationship. <laughs> What's amazing to me is we don't do that with Jesus, but we think we're in relationship with him. You ever seen somebody's Facebook status that says they're in a relationship, but you know them real well and you'll never see the person and like Tommy on Martin saying you got a job, but you don't ever see him go to work. <laughs> and I know it's funny, but some of us do that with the Lord. We say we're in a relationship with him, but we do nothing. There is no affection toward him. There is no allegiance to him. There's no action toward him. And I'm telling you, if that's the case for you, you don't know him. Because those who know him and are his keep his commandments because we learn to love him, not because of what we've done. I hope that you haven't heard me at all say that this happens by what we've done. No, it's undeserved. It happens all because of God's amazing grace. And if I'm going to continue to run this amazing race, it's going to have to be by God's amazing grace. Because in the midst of my disgrace, God still gives me his grace. 